I was Muslim English, and she was, she heard my accent, she's like, all right, well, he sounds like he's French, so she switched to French, and I switched to my chef from Bokdo, she was like, right? he's not French, I don't know where the fuck he is. <laughs> and she literally said, like, while I was speaking in French, she's like, I've never done heroin, but when I hear you speak, I think that's what it's like. <laughs> And then I'll give her the benefit of the doubt who the person who said that the most romantic language in the world is French has never been to Boktosh. <laughs> the phrase check that she got has never turned on anybody. <laughs> and I'm not I'm not that strong in English, but I'm not talk better like in French, like in you know, like when you switch from one language to the other. Like even like a, when I was young, okay, if I didn't know what the English word was, I would say the French word in English. So like a deer in French, we call it chevre. So for the longest time, we call it a chevral. And when there was a bunch of them, I was like, oh, what's some chevralysis? But talking like that got me in trouble, okay? Like one of my first jobs, I moved to Moncton, I got a job in a call center, and I'm not allowed to say which one. So I will tell you it sounds a lot like Mr. Rogers without the word mister. <laughs> And there was this girl, okay, she was, she was in the cubicle right next to me. I didn't know her at all, right? And she looked like she was kind of open, because she had like those fireman calendars, like, you know, those buffed up fireman. And I was thinking, I don't know where they get those firemen, but it's not in their machine. <laughs> Is there a fireman in the hall right now? Or? Do you want me to point out where the exits are? Or am I just... But no, like, here's how I got in trouble with her, okay? Like one day I decided, I'm gonna talk to her. And it's a day that she had brought a fruit tray and there was some pineapple in there. And so I wanted to ask her about the pineapple. Now in French, we call it pineapple, and I don't know, with an S at the end. And I forgot that it was called a pineapple in English. So the way that it came out of my mouth is, so how does your name is tasted? Is it good? <laughs> that's how I lost my job at the concert. <laughs> relationship for a while, like the sex kind of gets routine a little bit, and it gets, so you decide you're gonna spice things up. Well, I put my foot down the day that she asked me for a rim job, okay? A couple people laugh because they know what that is. If you don't know what that is, we're all gonna learn together here, okay? Now that's when somebody asks you to eat their ass. And my answer to that was like, no, I'm not doing that. And her response was like, I will do it for you. I'm like, I don't want you to do it for me. And she's like, don't you love me? I'm like, well, not anymore. And she was all mad. I couldn't believe it. The same woman who's grossed out if I eat an M&M that fell on the floor is pissed off that I don't want to lick her anus. So now I'm dating because of that. And when you date and you do comedy, like oftentimes, like women well, people ask me, like, oh my God, tell me a joke. Like I'm a jukebox or something. So I have this street joke that I use every single time. It's always the same one. It's what's the difference between a normal thermometer and a rectal thermometer? And the difference is the taste. Now, it's an old street joke, okay? And the thing about that joke is like, this is how a joke works. What's the difference between a normal thermometer and a rectal thermometer? That's the setup. If you don't know what the punchline is, the correct answer between that is, I don't know. What this one girl said is, one feels better than the other. That was a red flag for me right there. <laughs> Shit, she's gonna ask me for a rim job. <laughs> so this place is still a church on Sundays, right? Yes. <laughs> I lost 30 pounds just by cutting sugar. That's it, just by cutting sugar. I lost 30 pounds. And I'm from that generation where a lot of us were actually, I was a chubby kid. Okay, when I grew up, and basically everybody in my school, we were all chubby kids. And then in our 20s, we were still chubby. And in our 30s, we started taking our health in hand, started going to the gym, losing weight. But the fact that we were chubby, that's not our fault, that's our parents' fault. And I'll tell you why. Yes, exactly. That's because basically every generation, every generation had their parents say, finish your plate. Right? Everybody had that. Now, in the 80s, if you didn't finish your plate, what did your mom say? She said, they got the little children in Africa, don't have anything to eat. So now you're a kid, okay? So you're thinking of the little children in Africa, don't have anything to eat. So you force yourself to finish the plate, okay? Because you're thinking, oh my God, children in Africa don't have anything to eat. Then you become a teenager, 
Okay, so you can still force yourself to finish that plate because you're thinking of those little children in Africa that don't have anything to eat. And then you become an adult. Well, as an adult, you do your groceries, but you're still thinking of those little children in Africa that don't have anything to eat, so you keep finishing your plate. But now because you're finishing your plate, you have to go to the gym. So basically, you pay for the surplus of food because you keep finishing your plate, and now you have to pay for that gym membership, and that's why the cost of living keeps going up. It's because those old children in Africa didn't have anything to eat in the 80s. Like, remember those World Vision commercials? That woman, she would walk like 12 miles a day just to get water for her kids. It's like, oh, I'm thinking it. Just move closer to that well. So it's like, you're walking that every single day. Then you can spend more time with your kids, teach them if you do this, the fires are just gonna go away. <laughs> I was actually doing this show in, uh, in Shingen, I went for the Hubcap last year, and um, this guy I don't even know saw me, okay? And I didn't know him at all. He does he did his movie, alright? This was the first time seeing him, and he saw me during the show, and he thought I was really good, and then he was talking to somebody that I know, and he said, yeah, I saw Martin during the show. Yeah, he was really great, but he got really quick. Is he on coke? And I found that so great. Like, he thinks my career is going so well, I got coke money. <laughs> I don't have coke money. Like, I was doing this show in um, in Val d'Amour like earlier because if you don't know where Val d'Amour is, it's near Camelton. I was doing this show there because my career is on fire once again. And this is how you know your career is going great. Like there was a poster, it was a there was a picture of my face and everything on it in Val d'Amour, and below my face was written Pascal Sony. My name is fucking Martin. Like, <laughs> And for those that, like, you saw me walking, you saw me, like, walking a little bit weird, you're probably, walking, like, wondering, like, did you get hurt shuffling or something? <laughs> but the thing is, is that I have this thing called muscular dystrophy. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah? Okay, cool. You're plotting muscular dystrophy. That's not that right here. If I, <laughs> if I had cancer, I'd get a steady motivation. <laughs> For the few that don't know what it is, it's a disease that you're, you're born with, okay? You can't catch it, so ladies, it's okay if we French after the show. And basically, I was diagnosed with that around the age of like five, six years old. Doctors said like, uh, you're gonna be around the age of like 11, 12 in a wheelchair and in crutches, and around the age of like 20, basically, like you're paralyzed. Like you're in a wheelchair, wheelchair bound, neck down, nothing works. Exactly like Stephen Hawkins, except I'm an idiot. And um, here's the thing, because of my determination, resiliency, I'm 40 years old, I'm standing on this stage in front of you guys right now, and doctors, they can't believe it. They say I'm the only person in your Brunswick with this disease at the age of 40, not, in my, not only am I still walking since 21, but I've been able to fuck over 20 women, and just give them an orgasm, and it's... The women are applauding because they speak with normal men, they know how hard it is. And, but before you get excited, I think nine of them faked it. <laughs> now, some people will come up to me and they'll ask me, like, why are you walking a little bit funny? And like, they're kind of like, you know, like, jaggy about it. And I have no problems at all with telling them. Old people can be really rude about it. Old people can be really rude and, and ignorant. If you want to know if you gain weight, lost weight, go to an old folks' so home, those old people will tell you. Right? There was this woman, her name was Perez, okay? She was following me around the Selby's and she decided to pop the question. She's like, what's the matter with you? Are you handicapped? That was so rude. So I, I'm going to teach Perez a lesson. And like, no, Perez, I walk with a limp as I have a really big hog. <laughs> Your face. Like, I just keep on going. I'm like, oh, dear ass. It's, when I go pee, I don't shake it. I have to kick it. It's like, it's. When, when I need to go and put pepper on the tip, when she sneezes, I know I'm far enough. <laughs> Sometimes I, I can fall down, like I, I fall down easily, okay? So, 
Like during the, like, especially like during the winter season, like I fall down. So I have this system is what I do is I walk, like I do like little like steps and I, I squeeze my fence and I hope for the best. So it works like this. And the thing about that is I actually did that joke uh, in November for a special that's going to go on CBC and it's going to go on AMI TV. AMI, if you don't know it, it's actually audio description for the visually impaired. So that means that me walking like this is going to be described by somebody on TV. I'm like, what does that look like? I'm like, the best way I can describe what this looks like to a blind person is imagine somebody that's getting out of their car, they're going towards their house, their house is above the distance of, from the exit sign, and they're going towards their house and they really need to take a shit. And it's like, <laughs> Like I need to work hard, I need to exercise. Uh, I stopped going to the gym though, because like normal people will have like free weights, they'll have anywhere between like 10 and 50 pounds. I'm there with little three pounders. So I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna buy the three pounders and work out at home. I bought a treadmill, I bought the three pounders. But it was really embarrassing buying the three pounders, especially since the last pair that was left was pink. And I, I got to the counter and the person at the counter was judging me. And she was judging me. She's like, my God, you're buying three pounders. And what I did, I just basically went, no, this is, this is not for me, these are for my girlfriend. Yeah, she's gonna put them up my ass later on. It really helps me to walk in snow. It's, questions all the time and here's the question that's asked to me most of all is does it work down there and what I hate about that question is that only men ask me never women it's always <laughs> and the answer is it does work by the way ladies it does and with this like with this does sometimes like I can fall down and I can really hurt myself like when I do and it happened to me actually five years ago I broke my arm right here and as I was in, in the hospital, he, he got me there, and I was like in the waiting room, okay? And I was like really scared, I was really sweating, and in walks this cute little redhead nurse, okay? She walks in, and she says, Mr. Sonia, I'm here to prep you for your surgery. I'm like, you can prep me for anything you want. Jesus Christ, I should break my arm more often. <laughs> and then she says, all right, I'm gonna need two samples, okay? I'm gonna need one of your nostril and the other one of your rectum. I looked at her, I'm like, my rectum? Why do you need a sample of my rectum? I broke my arm, not my ass. Can you explain to me why? And she said this, I swear to God, this really what she said, I'm not certain I'm new. That is not reassuring just before somebody goes up your ass with a q tip, okay? <laughs> so what happens, she started to go with nostrils, she was going in really deep, that made me nervous because I knew exactly where she was going next. <laughs> so when it came time, I put my now she starts going in with the Q-tip. As soon as she starts going in, my ass sees right there. Q-tip could go further, she could board up. That Q-tip was stuck. It was stuck right there. And she's like, relax, Marty, relax. I'm like, yeah, Marty, relax. You got a hot little nurse going up your ass with a Q-tip. She's not sure why. Perfect moment to relax, right? shows for kids because of that. And some of the songs, they, they say, hey, would you like to come and inspire the children in our school? I was like, no, not for sure. <laughs> but I saw the budget that they had in the school. I was like, fuck yeah, it's going to inspire the kids. Inspire their faces off. <laughs> I was curious, so I, I asked them, is there something you guys don't want me to say? And like, oh, just basically think of that when you went to school. That's not going to work. <laughs> in the 80s. And sometimes, like, if a teacher called and said, the supply teacher would actually be our principal. And I remember it was in sixth grade. This is a true story. Sixth grade comes in the class to sixth graders. He decided he's going to tell us the, the, he's going to tell us about the movie that he saw the night before where they were interrogating this guy and this guy only answered by whistling. So they pulled out his pants, they put his penis on the table, they whacked it with a piece of wood. To this day, I have no fucking clue what that had to do with Bible study. It's, 
Or like, I wasn't sure if I could relate to things or not, too, because I, I had a nephew, he's 11 years old, and my sister got him a cell phone at 11. I was like, why the fuck would you get him a cell phone? She's like, oh, it's for his protection. I'm like, his protection against what? Like, well, what happens if he gets kidnapped? How the fuck is the cell phone gonna protect him? What's he gonna do? Send you a text from the back seat? Hey, mom, this where I'm sleeping tonight. But, <laughs> but I think there's just a part of me that's jealous of today's kids. Because you see them arriving at grandma and grandpa's house with like iPads and iPhones they get to play with. When I went to my grandparents' house, there was only two things I got to play with. The first thing was the fan. Remember that? You do that all the way all these settings. And when she put it away, the only thing that was left was that spring behind the bathroom door. Like, 